Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text this week, which is the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on September 6, 2020, are Ezekiel 33, 7 through 11, or if you are a semi-continuous Old Testament church, Exodus 12, 1 through 14. The psalm is 119, verses 33 through 40. Romans 13, 8 through 14. And the gospel text is Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. It's a big shout out to our friend and podcasting colleague, Joy J. Moore, who is uh, trying to get some late August vacation in. So we told her we would try not to mess this up in her absence. Pressure's on. We all have to talk to like, what, 33% more or something like that? Yeah, that's a lot. You can do it. That's a lot. You all right. Well, especially it's good that there's at least three of us here because the text is about confronting people and taking a buddy with you to go and confront someone. So um, Caroline, Rolf, and I have something we want you to know. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Another member of the church sins against you. Go and point out the fault. They won't listen. Bring one or two others along with you. I am so glad that Audrey West said this is not like a template for like conflict resolution, like in every sense. Like there are yeah. ways that this pattern can actually be dangerous. Just to flag that at the very beginning. Well, I think, I think that's important. And the other thing that's important is maybe to pull back from the specificities of, of the process and just to note the ways, in which, uh, the, the ways in which Jesus is speaking to the need for how, our, how will we be in community and how critical that is and what does community discipline look like and how, uh, how is it that we set that up and uh, and when and how do we reflect on that as a community, as a church, when uh, when when situations arise? What what are our processes? Uh, what 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 are the ways in which we engage each other uh, with a kind of you know a kind of civility, but toward toward this idea of of goal of reconciliation? So I think it's uh, you know it's worthwhile even before thinking about uh, preaching this for the preacher to, to think about that in their own context of, of what, are, what, are those kinds of, uh, what are those kinds of procedures that are in place when we think about how is it that we choose to be in community. And I think, I, I think particularly now when, uh, when community is so different uh, with COVID-19 and also going into the fall as, as communities uh, are wondering how to be in community and um, as we move uh, closer to, at least in the states, the election and the ways in which we choose to um, engage each other and, and how do we commit to be engaged with one another. So I, I would maybe start there of thinking about that uh, before diving into some of, the, some of the specifics of the text. There's a variant in the Western uh, D document on verse 15 that says, if a member of the church sins against you, talk about them behind their back and post it on social media and make sure everybody knows what a complete jerk they are. Then go talk about them again and report them to human resources. And if anybody disagrees with you, they're evil. It's a, it's a that, long variant. Yeah, that I, I haven't run old. across that one. So yeah. that's a new variant for me, Rolf. Thanks. From the gospel of holy resentments. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Which is, but so, I mean, I raised, I, I raised the issue because Although Audrey West is correct that this is not a template for um, reconciliation in every respect, it's a big advance. I mean, the whole idea of it is a pretty big advance over normal human behavior, which is normal human behavior is to, um, at least as I've seen it existed in all the normal human beings I've known uh, <laughs> in my 55 plus years of life, is uh, not to do this. It's, it's instead to, to nurse as Matt said, resentment, and then uh, and then a sense that I've been wronged, and then to gossip and talk about it, and um, rather than move towards reconciliation immediately. I think that's an important point, Rolf, because it it what we're recognizing here is that this is naming 
this is naming uh, an aspect of the human condition um, that our, what is our tendency? Our tendency is to go to the direction that you're talking about. And that, you know, as a Christian community, uh, we are called to a different kind of way of being uh, and in a different kind of way of manifesting the kingdom of heaven. And so even in our, even in our individual communities, that's our calling. And uh, it, not only for the sake of each other, but for the sake of what do people see from the outside of how is it that the church navigates what it means to live in community and to be committed to uh, a healthy um, and uh, community of regard. And the other thing I'm really struck by too in this passage is how often the verb to listen occurs. And, and if we kind of step back and think about that aspect of, of healthy community, of listening and not talking over and, uh, and talking so as to explain or to correct, but really to listen so as to understand um, and listen to, uh, to appreciate. I think that, um, I, I, yeah, I just, I'm sure I saw it before, but just really struck by that this time around of that of that aspect of, of, of listening. Yeah, there's one problem with it. Um, and that is that I think Matthew as a very um, Jewish informed gospel, I mean, I believe the school of Matthew that Matthew, right, it comes from a, Matthew himself is, uh, is, a, Jew, uh, is a Jewish Christian. I know that's an oxymoron, but you, could, you know what I'm saying is that um, he was Jewish. I follow my teacher, Arlen Hulkern, on this. Anyway, my point is that in the Old Testament, the metaphor to listen to, Shema Le, as in, you know, Abraham listened to Sarah, and he did what she told him to do to Hagar. To listen to is an idiom that means to obey. So that's the danger, um, is that some people regard the act of, if, if you haven't, it's not just that you have to listen to me, then you have to listen to me, is it to agree with me in the idiom? And that's not the kind of listening you're talking about, Caroline. No, no. And I'm not sure that's the idiom Matthew is talking about when you look at it in context. Um, uh, that, I mean, I... In, I think in it terms is, actually. Really? Well, because it says, you know, um, go and point out the fault. And if the member refuses to listen to you, um, meaning to correct their fault. Hmm. Um, I, okay. I agree totally with you about the importance of listening. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of us confuse that if somebody then doesn't agree with us, they haven't listened to us. Well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I, I'm trying to take a wider stance on that. Correct. In terms of, uh, you know, in terms of how is it that we, you know, what are the, what are the, what are going to be the marks of, of how we engage in community? And, um, and I think, I think you can go in that direction and say that this is something to which Matthew is calling us. I think we're putting our finger on one of the problems with this text is that it's written as if it's a really clear cut issue, right? Clearly one person has sinned against somebody else. Clearly guilt resides in one person and one person alone. And these one or two other witnesses seem to know it as well. And it's, it's this clear cut case, which as we know is not always how uh, strife manifests itself and there are other stories. I would I also want to widen this too away from just an individual in conflict between two individuals and talk about the ways in which this passage might address uh, whole communities and especially with that that key word of, of listening there um, in a time at least in the United States but I believe this is also quite worldwide of, of so much reawakening to the need for healing, for racialized healing, and the ways in which the white church has been told repeatedly by other congregations, um, largely Christians who are people of color, you're not listening to us. You're not seeing what we've been trying to tell you for years. Uh, this is a text that really catches my attention uh, this time around in the lectionary, right? Of being that one or that community in this text who has been told, who has had witnesses come to confirm uh, this is our struggle, right? This is what we need you to do. This is what we need you to listen to. Um, which is interesting, right? Because there's not much in this particular story that tells the one who has transgressed what then to do or how to make amends, uh, except to pay attention to what's being told to you. 
think the other uh, critical aspect about this text is, uh, you know, we tend to take 1820 out of context um, as a as a lovely uh, statement about, you know, the presence of Emmanuel, God with us, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And and I, I certainly do that and count on that. And I think that that's uh, an important aspect of Matthew's promise and Matthew's Christology. Put back in its context, however, it what does it say? It says, it says that, uh, that Jesus is present, that God is present in these negotiations. Uh, that God is God is here in in all of this, and uh, I think I, you know I wonder how much we remember that that uh, when we do engage with each other in community, when we do think about listening or not listening, uh, do we imagine that God is in the room? Uh, do we imagine God is present and watching <laughs> and listening God's self, uh, or are we content to? It's, are we are we saying that well God's really not paying attention? So I think it's a really important reminder that uh, God cares about this, uh, and and God is not only present uh, in in situations of of well God is always present, but and particularly here naming the presence of 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 these kinds of conversations that, that are difficult to have, but necessary to have, and uh, God's there. Yeah, and if you're going to actually live in a relationship with the one that has been reconciled to us, to whom we've been reconciled through Jesus Christ, you have to be willing to be reconciled to your neighbors that you've sinned against, who have sinned against you. That is, I mean, the, the, the presence of God, who is a reconciling God, demands that you be a reconciling community. Ezekiel 33, which, you know, if we want to talk about a forgiving God is an interesting text, uh, but there you go. But I, I really want to call attention to the commentary by Carly Crouch, because I think it's really good. Uh, but she also does something at the very end of her commentary that uh, not a lot of our authors do, where she says, uh, you know, basically those who want to see a more uh, detailed discussion of this are welcome to contact the author directly. So she's at Fuller Seminary if you're looking uh, to figure out what that what that is. But if you like the commentary and want more, she has put herself out there to um, uh, provide access to an article. How cool is that? Yeah. That made me happy. And I think I never do that. But um, nevertheless, great that she, you know, she highlights this ways in which uh, Ezekiel, for all of its, oh, I don't know, all of the, the roughness of this book in a variety of ways, uh, still does hold out this hope of uh, even the most apparently unrepentant or even the one most addicted to sin might nevertheless um, um, be changed, be cleansed by the mercy of God. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I just, excited by I, that, I I, well, no, I kept thinking of a napkin that I ran across uh, a, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago that said, uh, dear karma, I have a list of people you missed. Um, and so that's the, that's what I thought about. In, <laughs> that though, you know, the wicked will suffer the consequences of their wickedness. <laughs> so I was like, I had a new appreciation for Ezekiel in that. Uh, when I thought about my cocktail napkin. But that, that I wouldn't preach that, but I'm just saying. You wouldn't, okay. <laughs> that, is the, that is the regime under which we live, though. Yes, it and, is. Which is, uh, yeah. it's okay to cancel people uh, if they disagree with you, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Exodus 12, uh, and you can see Michael Chan's uh, commentary on the website uh, regarding it, which is so, you know, in, uh, there's sort of a weird hybrid that goes on towards the end of the whole plagues narrative. So, you know, it's sort of, that is, you're getting, uh, you're getting both the story of the Exodus itself but then the story of the um, initi initiation of the Passover uh, meal, right? So, that, and they're all going together. Um, and um, so it's, uh, we're dropping down 
here in the story that is kind of the place they join, right? It's a story of the place both that um, is the story of that the first Passover, but then also the story of the initiation of this annual festival. Um, to me, like one of the important, you know, so it says in verse 14, this shall be a day of remembrance for you. Uh, you should celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. The word festival is, a, is you know, a big word. It's one of the three annual festivals in the Israelite calendar for us, they're Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. And the idea of, it's, so it's a little weird, it comes in September here, but the idea of celebrating annually um, through our own family and close community, um, memorials, the big actions of God in our history. I really appreciated uh, Michael Shan as our colleague at Luther Seminary. And uh, I, a couple of things that he said in the commentary really made me think. One uh, is Passover is a wartime liturgy. And I just never, I never thought about um, that in terms of the way in which ritual or liturgy uh, is, or th this particular liturgy or ritual is, is in response to that. And then also toward the end of his commentary, that the Passover meal, however, ensures that they are regularly attentive to the memory of liberation. And I think that is, um, that's a particularly, you know, critical theological theme uh, but the ways in which uh, it, the ways in which that might resonate right now, uh, in terms of, in terms of the rituals or th this particular ritual that calls attention to uh, the fact that God is a God of liberation, uh, and and how is it that we how is it that we do pay attention to that and don't pay attention to that, and the ways in which this particular ritual uh, it it reminds us every year that this is who, this is the God whom we follow and this is the God in whom we believe, who's committed to freedom. And uh, so, yeah, both of those things were really, I thought, um, very striking in the commentary. I really appreciated those. Yeah, I was also struck by that wartime liturgy comment and how that kind of transformed my view on, on Passover. In, in next week's commentary, I read ahead, uh, Michael will talk about the how to deal with the destruction of Pharaoh's armies. And, and that also in many ways applies to this text because even though we skip over all the plagues, these are horrible stories of immense suffering. And Michael brings up, and plenty of other commentators have done this, maybe Walter Brueggemann most popularly, the ways in which this is not just simply a battle um, against the Egyptians, this is a battle against foreign gods. This is a battle against Pharaoh as a kind of anti-God deity of his own. Uh, and so it, it caught my attention in verse 12 that the God is promising here to strike down the firstborn human and animals and then on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. Um, and who are those, those deities? And you know, we can take that word gods uh, in kind of more metaphorical ways if we want, but to think as well, like what are our own national gods? What are the different kinds of cultural gods that we cling to that, that need to be struck down, that aren't here to negotiate, right? That aren't here to be reasoned with or to say, well, you can have these days of the week and you know, Jesus gets those days of the week, but that there is a liberative aspect to this when you're talking about gods that will uh, demand that will totalize that will enslave um, so to help people get a sense of that this is not just simply punishment on the Egyptians this is there's a deeper mythical battle taking place in these stories that is odd perhaps to a lot of our ears but um, makes a lot of sense when we start poking around in our own systems and then I think you, you really have to read the last uh, in Hebrew, in Hebrew, uh, yeah, I was trying to say in English and it came out wrong, at verse 12, the last uh, four words, I am the Lord. That is the point of, the point of Yahweh's battle with Pharaoh is who is Lord of the people and I am Yahweh. I mean, that is, and you get that in Ezekiel too, strangely, uh, strangely matched up here that why, I mean, what's at stake in all of this? What's at stake is the very identity of God as, as both the Lord of Israel, 
and then the Lord uh, of creation. Um, Terry Fretheim has um, strongly emphasized that Pharaoh is anti-creation in these uh, in these chapters, uh, defying the Creator's life-giving will for for the planet, and that Yahweh is um, sustaining creation. And and you know, you, that's what Pharaoh has done throughout throughout these th throughout these battles. And so what's what's at stake is I am the Lord. Uh, More on that next week too. Yeah. So, by the way, before we move on, this might be a chance um, just to do uh, maybe in Bible study this week, or in an adult class, or maybe in the sermon, uh, a brief bit of of, of interreligious education, uh, so, that, so that this is talking about Passover. So the weird thing is, Passover is the first festival of um, of the year. It's the spring festival, but right now in the next month. Um, Jews will celebrate the, the High Holy Days and then the last festival. So this year, uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is the first of the High Holy Days, is September 18th through 20th. Yom, Yom Kippur is a week later, the 27th and 28th. And then Booths is October 2 through 9th. So um, just to help people get all that straight, um, this is... Passover is the spring, but now we're in the next month, we're going to hit all of the, uh, not all of them, but three of the other, the two High Holy Days and the third festival. I think uh, if we go to the psalm uh, and we look at that portion of the psalm, the ways in which, uh, I guess if I were preaching this week, the ways in which you might use some of the language in the psalm to unpack some of the themes that we've already talked about with regard to the um, gospel lesson and the Old Testament lessons of, of what are the Lord's statutes um, and uh, observing the Lord's statutes, uh, keeping your law and ob observing it with my whole heart and, you know, recognizing um, the ways in which that the ways in which we turn toward other directions and and this is a call back to God. So I think there's a way in which the psalm could function that way in your preaching this week. The turning here that's talked about uh, sort of over and over again is not um, is not shuv. It's not repent. So I just thought that might people might just be interested in that in, the, in verse 36 and then again in verse 39 that you're getting so all right and then we've got romans this is our second to last uh reading from romans we've been going through romans uh throughout the entire uh summer and uh again uh the way in which you could even use romans with regard to what we've been talking about um in terms of what is a what is the mark of the Christian community? And that's to love one another, that the, that the kinds of ways in which we engage each other uh, and, uh, you know, in that kind of communal discipline of those communal, uh, those communal practices is, uh, is for the sake of, uh, is for the sake of love and because of love. Uh, so that may be one direction you could take with the, with the Romans text. Yeah, this is where uh, where Paul and the Synoptic Gospels are not too far apart, right? Mm -hmm. That's uh, just as Jesus talks about the the, the greatest commandment, um, and then the second being being like it. That uh, Paul in Galatians five, and again here, will talk about the ways in which love is the the fulfillment of the law. And again, there's huge debates about what exactly fulfill means there, but uh, that would take away from the more important thing that. He's describing this as, like you said, Caroline, the hallmark of, of Christian community. He even in verse 10 gives an explanation for why love fulfills the law. It does no wrong to a neighbor, which I think if Paul had an editor, might have wanted to rewrite that a little more strongly, right? That love not only does no harm, but, but um, ensures or tends to the well-being of a neighbor is also part of that. And that's, again, Rolf talked about doing some, some interreligious exposure or education to think about ways in which the law functions in the Old Testament. And this is, again, the same letter where earlier Paul talked about enslavement to the law, talked about all of the ways in which the law becomes kind of a breeding ground for sin. Uh, but yet here in chapter 13, Paul goes back to the law and says, this is why love is so important. This is not a new Christian ethic 
uh, we've already learned about this from God's revelation in previous generations. Yeah, I mean, verses 8 through 11, 8 through 10, rather, there's nothing specifically Christian as opposed to, to Israelite or Jewish about those. All, any of my Jewish friends and scholars would read verses 8 through 10 and say, yep, that's, that's what it says in the Old Testament. That's what it says in our Bible, they would say. It's then when Paul then moves, the specifically, uh, actually, uh, then it's when Paul moves into for salvation is nearer, that, that maybe he gets to a specifically Christian eschatology there. But I think that's important. I think in that, in that move, for salvation is nearer to us, uh, to connect that with, uh, with the expression of love is something, is something that you could preach about to say it's in, that, it's, it's in that love, it's in that communal love of loving one another that we do glimpse, that we do experience the kind of um, saving or salvation that God wants for us.